Our next guest is, I, I must say, someone um, I've had the uh, fortunate opportunities of uh, interviewing several times, many times, on my shows. She's going to talk to us about the importance of how financial inclusion for micro entrepreneurs is critical, of course, for global growth. She wants to address the challenge from a global perspective and argues that leaders of the 21st century, they require imagination to address, of course, the disruption to banking and finance and, of course, its implications for the global economy. I will add, she's a former US presidential advisor mm, to George W. Bush and was on the National Economic Council where she handled, well, she handled all the financial market issues. She uh, co-founded H Robotics, which makes modular AI-led commercial use drones for a, a wide range of industries, including mining, oil and gas, insurance, public safety. She also founded the, D, the DRPM Group, which advises institutional investors worldwide on investment trends. It's very important to get that chair right. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Pippa Malgram. Come on up, Pippa. Hello. <laughs> Always lovely to see you. Grab a chair. Thanks for joining us on stage. Um, good, I can get to talk to you without cameras I know, in front amazing. of us. Amazing. Um, <laughs> Why imagination? Because imagination, in my view, it's the most undervalued, underutilized aspect of what we do in finance and business. Because you can't actually get to a destination unless you imagine it first. I love the quote from Mark Twain, where he says, eyes cannot see clearly if the imagination is out of focus. And I think that's exactly right. That's and, and so much of what we've been talking about today is the imagination of the regulators here in Bahrain. They have imagined a world that now we are creating. So it's essential. Uh, I think also people in the finance world don't appreciate how important storytelling is. If you can't tell the story of what you're doing, no one can follow you. Mm. It's an essential part of leadership. And storytelling is tied up with imagination. For example, NASA has an actual job called chief storyteller for NASA. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. You know, Silicon Valley increasingly will have someone designated in the companies they invest in as who is the chief storyteller of the company. Because especially with all this very sophisticated technology, yeah that does amazing things that most people can't understand. So if you can't tell that story, yeah. no matter how phenomenal it is, they won't follow you into the vision. You travel the world. Is there a lack, not obviously here, a lack of imagination then? Do you think in, in parts of the world we, we don't have enough people with the imagination? I think that we don't draw on imagination sufficiently. And you can see, for example, why is it that a company like Tesla has managed to acquire so much capital? They had a very imaginative vision of yeah. the future, right? Absolutely. And even though they have stumbles, they have falls, the rockets don't work from time to time, the clarity of their imaginative process is so great that people buy into where they're going. You can see other companies where they will explain, technically, we do this. It's very interesting, this thing that we do right here. <laughs> Nobody's very excited about it. They can't feel the imagination in it. And I think it does cause a lot of technology in companies that otherwise might succeed to fail for lack yeah. of imagination. Because there's also one thing is, is imagination, and then there's following it up yes. with, with the innovation, of course. So um, where do you see the most impactful enablers for entrepreneurs? Well, so many things. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very interested in ideas. Now, how do we translate ideas into action? Now, I'm someone, as you said, I've worked for the President of the United States. That's all about translating ideas into action when you work in the Oval Office. But I've also founded a company that makes uh, aerial robotic tools for industry. So one of the key things is diversity of thinking. Now. People talk a lot about diversity of people. I am all for diversity of people. And by the way, I've been very impressed here during my trip to Bahrain at how many women are involved in the financial services sector, are here on the stage. Diversity of gender, 
great, but I'm also interested in diversity of ethnicity, diversity of neuroplasticity, how your brain is wired, diversity of personal experience, diversity of income, because the key thing is diversity of thinking. And you know you're in trouble when everyone agrees. Yeah. This, is the way, this is when you know you're in trouble. Now, I see it as an economist uh, in the recent years when I've had the view that President Trump would win the election. And people said, you are out of your mind. It is totally obvious that he will never win. When 100% of the people say he will never win, mm -hmm. mm, something to watch. Same thing with Brexit in the United Kingdom. Uh, and as you know, I'm advising the British government on that subject. Uh, so many people said, Brexit will never happen. This is the moment I thought, okay, yeah, here something, go, yeah. <laughs> here, something is up. So having a diversity of opinion is crucial because as an entrepreneur, and I know from being one, mm. you have to have extraordinary conviction. But at the same time, that's your vulnerability, is your certainty. What you have to do is um, embrace the idea that you could be wrong, that you might not be right to be certain, because it opens your mind to looking at things that you wouldn't have considered before. So, for example, in, in my world of constructing drones, commercial drones, right? We live in a world where most of the drones are fundamentally retail consumer toys, and I make something that's been designed, as Brett said this morning, from first principles for industry. Who's my competitor? It's actually not the other drone companies because they were all built as toys and they yeah. break because they don't work. Satellites. Who's satellites. Oh. Satellites. Yeah. And satellites are cheap. They're good. Mm -hmm. Now they have problems, but this is only possible because I'm imagining what is the competitive landscape in an unconventional way and I'm open to the possibility that I'm not that my certainty isn't co correct. So I guess the message is you have to embrace the uncertainty. In fact, that's where the profits are, hmm. is and the uncertainty. And you, you referred to Tesla, and in Elon Musk has what you just described in leaps and, you know, hmm. in tons full, doesn't it? Um, let's talk about AI and the financial. What, what impact do you think AI is going to have? on this industry? Enormous. Uh, yeah. Let me describe how I see it. We now live in a world where there is ubiquitous gathering of data. All of us are emitting data constantly. It's in the seams in our clothes, the chips that are revealing our location right now, in the soles of your shoes. Uh, every time you pass a camera, every time a satellite captures your image, when you drive a car, the car is emitting data. The phone in your pocket, the rubbish bin in your house, the refrigerator in your kitchen are all gathering information about you. You shout to the kids, so the spaghetti is ready. All the Internet of Things devices in your home know spaghetti is purchased in this house. <laughs> now imagine these are quadrillions of data points. They are gathering in an invisible kind of holographic space a kind of data sphere. Now, traditionally, each of these silos of data, the data that's coming from your refrigerator, the data that's coming from your iPhone, the data that's coming from the chips in your clothes, in the past, they were separate silos. Today, artificial intelligence connects the dots. Right. And that's what gives you this data sphere with connectivity, which I would describe as a crystal ball. It's literally what humanity has always wanted. It's a way of seeing reality with far more precision than you could ever see reality itself. But it's also a place of radical transparency where the world will see you and your company with much more clarity than you can even see yourself. And so artificial intelligence is hugely important. But we have to think about it as a thing that is going to tell us stuff we may or may not want to know. Well, that is true, too. Yeah. That is true. Before we wrap it up, too, I want um, for you to give some advice to entrepreneurs, and maybe we have some in the room. Yeah. But just going back to this industry and AI, and that, if you were to make a prediction, I know it's a bit crystal ball gazing, but you know, okay. make a prediction for this year. Well, one, one thing, what, what, what do you reckon? Oh, it's so many things. Well, yeah. right now, as an economist, what I hear from everyone is the markets are going to collapse. Stock markets are going to fall. <laughs> world economy is going to fall apart. 
I have exactly the opposite view, and I could give you 20 reasons why. Did it take too long now? But <laughs> as an entrepreneur, what I see is I can create, and anyone can create, world-class products without needing a lot of capital and without needing that much human input. Mm. So the old days of needing a lot of money and a big lab, and it's over. So small groups of people could create extraordinary things. And we've had a lot of that in the discussion this morning. In, in FinTech, you can do things off apps, which is well, exactly. quite extraordinary. Yeah. So everybody's preparing for a meltdown. And I think you should think about the possibility of a melt up. And this is a totally different way of thinking. The other thing, by the way, we should touch on is the microfinance for entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. because that's a topic for our discussion. What's really amazing is how hard it is for American innovators to go raise money from, say, Silicon Valley versus entrepreneurs in emerging markets who actually are more easily served by their finance and banking systems. When I look at the world, and I, I worked, for example, in Kenya in 1985 on a development project for women who ran businesses, because in Kenya it's mainly women who run mm -hmm. the businesses. Big business with stuff like a gas station. That's a big business in East Africa. Their capacity to actually be, raise capital was easier than what I see today for some small companies trying to get started in the U.S. Right. You actually think the U.S. is falling very far behind in innovation and financial services technology compared to what we've heard about all morning here. Mm. That's very much a function of our regulatory environment. And again, having been in the White House, the person in charge of financial services regulation, I can tell you, we love specifying the detail, which means we preclude a lot of innovation. And we have not only federal, but state-level financial services and insurance regulation. So your ability here in Bahrain, your ability here in the Middle East to leap way ahead of where we are in the United States is not to be underestimated. Okay, can I ask you for, and you've already touched on some of the elements, but some advice, perhaps there are some young entrepreneurs out there starting up, more about how they form the leadership, the right leadership, if you will, that embraces the, the digital modern age that we live in. Well, look, there's so many different aspects to entrepreneurship. One is nobody does it alone. Right. Even when it looks like they're doing it alone, nobody does it alone. Right. Bill Gates got started because his mother was on the board of a bank. So she did all the accounts. And she was the one who went to the bank to get the early finance, right? right. But everybody forgets this, right? He didn't do it alone. So who is your team? is the first question. And it's not just the people who are creating the business with you, it's who's the personal support network? Who's the person in your life that when you really have uncertainty or you're in trouble is gonna tell you the truth? Like the hard truth. Mm. By the way, that's all the way to the level of the president. The president of the United States, that's the biggest problem is who's gonna tell the president the truth? As this particular president is especially hard to tell the <laughs> truth to. Um, <laughs> So that's one thing. Second thing is you don't know everything you need to know more. So for example, uh, can I ask this audience, just raise your hand. How many of you read The Economist? Okay, how many read Wired? More than most Western audiences. In Western audiences, they all read The Economist, only a like few hands will be Wired. And I'm like, how can you innovate in any area? I don't care what your discipline is if you don't read Wired, because it's the one place that tells you about the breadth of innovations. And I truly believe that we are in the next industrial revolution. We are not waiting for it. It is we're already we're underway. Yeah. So if you don't comprehend the breadth of this, you can have a great idea that gets blindsided because your view wasn't broad enough. OK, so I do have to wrap it up, but you've already touched on the president, and because I had it down here, I wanted to ask you, I thought it'd be remiss, right, not to ask somebody who's been in the Oval Office uh, and worked for an administration. Um, president Trump, is he good for the US economy? Is he helping innovation, stifling innovation? 
So it's such an interesting question because people are so emotive about yeah. our current president to the point that they haven't been investing in the U.S. in recent years because they didn't like the president. And it's turned out the U.S. has been the best performing mm -hmm. industrialized economy. And interestingly, they've missed the fact that China is not competitive any longer. Mexico has replaced it because their wages are 20 to 40 percent cheaper. Vietnam. Yeah. So now you have the most competitive emerging market juxtaposed with the most competitive industrialized market. Now, let's come to Trump and his policies. Bottom line is, you may not like the way he talks, and most people don't, but he does have a small government, less red tape, lower taxes approach which is very beneficial to the performance of the economy. Mm -hmm. And it has performed well. I would not give him credit for everything. No. For example, the movement of Chinese companies to manufacture in the United States, uh, like uh, Foxconn has just built a production facility in Wisconsin. That was in play before he was elected. But nonetheless, this is the question markets now have. If he isn't the president next time around, do markets go up or down? Well, right, which, and yeah. my answer is actually, I still think they go up. I, I think the perform. U.S. will still perform because I don't think we're going to move to the left where we say tax the rich at 80%, which no. is kind of the current messaging. Yeah, even though Bernie is running again, we'll see. Ladies and gentlemen, Pippa Malgram. Pippa, Thank always a pleasure. So Thank you. Thank you very much.